Chapter 5, The Argument in the Council The next day, at dawn, the pimp arrived at Lord George's mansion in a carriage to pick up the prostitutes. Catherine and Lord Melbourne waved affectionately in the bedroom, when she finished dressing. Lord Melbourne peered discreetly out the window and saw Catherine climb into the carriage with the other girl. Some time later Lord Melbourne and Lord George were sitting in a small hall of the mansion, sharing an informal breakfast. So, how was your night? asked George, with a seemingly innocent expression on his face, but with a slight mocking smile. Good, what about yours? said Lord Melbourne seemingly seriously. Very good. Pleasant enough, if you do want to know, George replied shamelessly. Curious, George, it's funny that being so in love with your, your lady, you can enjoy the pleasure with other women, even prostitutes, Lord Melbourne said in a more thoughtful, than reproachful way. That is because for me my fidelity to the woman I love is not a matter of the body but of the soul, my heart is for one woman, but my body is for many women. My fidelity is not to abstain from enjoying pleasure with other women, my fidelity is in loving and protecting the woman I really want. But you would not understand that, of course, George replied. You know I'm not a sanctimonious or puritan hypocrite, but I do love a woman, I prefer to be faithful in everything. I was only unfaithful to Caroline when she was unfaithful to me, that was the same moment when I stopped loving her. Obviously you do not understand it because you adapt everything to your convenience, to the convenience of your appetites. Anyway, I will not deny that the experience of last night was pleasant but also was an inopportune risk, if the press learns that the, the Queen's fiancé was frolicking with a prostitute, would be a disaster, said Lord Melbourne as if he were warning of a serious danger. The fiancé of the Queen? I'm glad you're getting the idea, my dear friend said George in amusement. Do not be silly, George. You know that in the morning I'm not in a good mood, unless in these days. Why do not you tell me what the newspapers say today? Lord Melbourne said impatiently. Well, while you said about resting from last night's strenuous adventure, I had time to glance at some newspapers. George said, picking up some newspapers from a chair beside him, and setting them on the table next to the breakfast plates. The press is generally surprised by your sudden resignation, and by the fact that Her Majesty, your future wife. When George made that unnecessary clarification Lord Melbourne made a grimace of displeasure on his face, has commissioned the formation of the new government to peel. And certainly in some newspapers there are rumours coming from confidential sources of a wedding between Queen Victoria and her former Prime Minister Lord Melbourne. And of course, the first criticisms are already coming. Let me guess. Opportunist, social climber, ambitious unscrupulous, aspiring king without crown, irresponsible, intriguing, things like that are what they say about me, right? Lord Melbourne said with sarcasm and some bitterness. Yes, you know how some journalists and chroniclers are, but it was something predictable. It is the negative side of being the country with the greatest freedom of speech in the world, except the United States. But do not listen to the press, let alone the tabloid journalism, after all an alliance of your party and most of the Tory party to support the Queen's decision would hardly fail. I must admit I am still surprised that Leopold has convinced Wellington and Peel, especially Peel, but I imagine that the prospect of seeing this country go to hell if Cumberland comes to the throne was enough for them to dismiss their prejudices against you and resign themselves to have a Whig politician from consort of the Queen said George. Well, anyway, I must prepare for the storm. If the rumours began to circulate, when the Privy Council is called, there will be no doubt. Will rain the criticisms about me and about Victoria. I have to enlist, today will be an intense day. Lord Melbourne replied. A while later Lord Melbourne was ready to leave George's house when Emma Portman showed up at the house. She greeted George affectionately, since she was also his friend, and then saluted Lord Melbourne and congratulated him on his next marriage. Thank you, Emma. Is there any news from Palace? Asked Lord Melbourne seriously and somewhat concerned. 
Her Majesty must soon receive Peel to commission him the formation of the new ministry. The Queen was very sad and restless this morning, she asked a lot for you and I think she wants to see you as soon as possible, said Emma. Her Majesty will have to wait, I have to meet with Wellington and several influential politicians and members of the Privy Council, and with my press contacts. I have a lot of work to do to get this business to go forward, Lord Melbourne replied. But William. Emma said. Emma, we are fighting to save Her Majesty's crown. She is no longer a child, and she must understand, Lord Melbourne said sharply, then said goodbye to her and George and left. George, tell me the truth, how bad are things? Emma asked worriedly. Very bad. It has only been so bad just two previous occasions, when Caroline's scandal and when his boy died, only this time is worse than those two times answered George also worried. Worse. We have to do something George, Emma replied. I'm doing it, Emma, do not worry. I will be at his side at all times, I will do whatever is necessary, but I will get him to come to reason. I take care of him, and you take care of the Queen so that those two fools are will happy in spite of themselves. I'll take care of my boy, and you of your girl, and together we will, George said with a little enthusiasm. You're incorrigible, George. I hope you're right, Emma said with a small laugh. After Peel appointed his cabinet, the meeting of the Privy Council was urgently convened to discuss the planned marriage of Victoria to Lord Melbourne. Not surprisingly, there was discontent and some scandal, and quite a few criticisms of Victoria and Lord Melbourne, especially since Albert's death was very recent and mourning for him was just beginning, and his fiancée announced her wedding to another man. But the publicised support of Victoria's maternal family, who was Albert's paternal family, and in particular of King Leopold, served to mitigate criticism a little. In the few days before the meeting of the Privy Council, Lord Melbourne resorted to thousands of excuses not to go to Buckingham Palace and avoid uncomfortable meetings with Victoria, which made her feel more sad and desperate. Finally came the day of the meeting of the Privy Council and upon arriving at the meeting Victoria and Lord Melbourne saw each other for the first time since their painful separation, and she had to make a great effort not to break down to cry and Lord Melbourne reflected the emotion in his face, but with great effort remained calm. After Victoria read the short prepared text and announced her intention to marry Lord Melbourne, the nonconformists began murmurings. Wellington defended the Queen's decision to critics, as did the Duke of Sussex, Victoria's uncle. But another Victoria's uncle, the Duke of Cumberland, and King of Hanover, vehemently attacked his niece's decision, and dared to criticise her in almost offensive terms, while gave at Lord Melbourne disqualifications almost insulting. Lord Melbourne clenched jaw in anger, and he turned to look at Victoria, whose face was broken and through her cheeks began to roll a few tears, without her being able to avoid it. Lord Melbourne felt a rush of conflicting emotions, but the emotion he felt over others was his desire to protect Victoria and his hatred against anyone who hurt her. He realised that Victoria was about to retire, which would be a humiliation and a defeat before her wicked uncle and realised that neither the fool Peel who was by her side ashamed and almost frightened, nor the elderly Wellington and Sussex they were going to defend effectively to her and avoid that humiliation that would soon reach the press. So he stepped forward. Your Majesty! Lord Melbourne exclaimed, causing Victoria to stand paralysed as she rose to her feet, and to see him with her eyes open and a gesture between excited and surprised on her face Sir Robert, gentlemen, if allow me. I want to say a few words. Come in, Lord M. Lord Melbourne, Victoria said in a whisper. Victoria was sitting on the throne, on the small stage, presiding over the meeting while the members of the council listened standing. Lord Melbourne stood between her and the crowd, trying to see her and the members of the council, turning his head frequently. For the past two years I have had the honour of meeting Her Majesty the Queen, more than two years ago at the death of His Majesty King William IV, I met for the first time with our new Queen. That day in Kensington, I met a young woman, almost a girl, but I also met she was a Queen in every inch of her body and her soul. 
Victoria shuddered as she remembered that day and especially the meeting they had another day in her Buckingham Palace dormitory when, in the face of her own doubts, he told her that she looked to him like a queen in every inch of her. I found a young woman who, despite her young age and inexperience, despite the poor preparation she had received for the role destiny had in store for her, having been isolated from her uncle the king and the rest of the royal family, despite all these conditions, she was a young woman who showed aplomb, willingness to learn, willingness to serve her country and a natural dignity. I do not lie to you gentlemen when I tell them that I was moved and admired her, and I really felt that I was in the presence of a monarch who had greatness, a greatness that would make her one of the greatest monarchs this country has ever had in his history, and that could pilot this ship that is our country in the times so turbulent that we live. Victoria's eyes were damp, and her body trembled with emotion. As a subject, as a citizen of this country, I have an obligation to serve any monarch of England, whoever he may be, and even to give my life for him or for her. But how difficult it is to serve a monarch when he is not worthy of service and devotion. Fortunately ours is a free country, it is a country where there is freedom to speak and criticize even our kings. That is why it is no crime to censor the conduct of the members of our royal family, and that is why we can say that Britain had long needed a monarch to be proud of. The British people need to love and admire their kings, they need to find in them an example worthy of following, a reason to believe in the monarchy. And that is why it does not need monarchs of dissolute and petty behavior. That is why I am thrilled to find in Queen Victoria a monarch worthy of love, devotion, and respect, because she is a person willing to sacrifice everything, absolutely everything for duty. In her innocence and purity there was fervent determination to be faithful to her duties and loyal to the role her birth had reserved for her. In all this time I have seen her work tirelessly, working to fulfill her duties, studying to the point of exhaustion in order to be trained in the tasks inherent to her position. I do not lie to you when I tell you that I have seen to her to work more than double or triple that my laziest colleagues in Parliament. Lord Melbourne's words ripped out the audience some laughter that relaxed the atmosphere in the middle of the solemnity of his speech, and Victoria herself let out a small laugh that almost turned into pout because of her desire to cry. But above all, I have seen that the Queen has impeccable conduct and an unquestionable desire to honour the country with her actions so that no one who is not a scoundrel will ever reproach to her for anything, saying this, Lord Melbourne could not see Victoria in the face, and she shuddered and almost broke as she felt the pain and reproach that concealed those words, unlike those members of the royalty who have had a dissolute behaviour reprehensible, and have even been able to give rise to suspicions of horrible acts against human and divine law in public opinion. The Duke of Cumberland was startled as if he had been stung by a wasp, and his face turned red with anger as he felt everyone's eyes upon him, for everyone was aware that Lord Melbourne had made a little veiled reference to the suspicions of murder that had twice fallen upon the Duke. Wellington smiled wryly and malignantly, and even the Duke of Sussex ducked his head in embarrassment and amusement over the accusation against his brother. Her Majesty has my loyalty to death, because I have sworn it, for being my queen. But I tell you gentlemen that if this pledge did not bind me, and if she were not our queen. Continued Lord Melbourne, now fixing his intense gaze in Victoria's eyes, while she felt her heart beating fast and breathing hard under her corset, she would still have all my love and devotion, because with or without a crown, I have not met a woman more worthy of love, admiration, and respect. Victoria had to bend her head, because she could not help crying and had to cover her mouth with the back of her hand so that her pouting was not heard. But Lord Melbourne turned to face the others, and strode toward them, a little theatrical, to divert their attention from her and concentrate on him. That and no other is my reason to accept the proposal made by Her Majesty. Gentlemen, I have no other ambition in life to serve Her Majesty, and she has asked me to do so as her husband, and I am willing to do so even though I certainly do not consider myself worthy of such honour. Why the rush? Because the murder of the unhappy Prince Albert demonstrates how dangerous these times are and how fragile order is, Victoria is shifted in her seat, shocked to hear the name of Albert. The Queen wants to give an heir to the crown soon, to ensure the succession, is not something that should be underestimated in these times when we are threatened by radicals of all kinds. 
We need a young and admirable queen to maintain the loyalty of the people to the established order, but if she will miss we need an heir who arouses the same devotion of the people, nothing better than a tender child to awaken that devotion. We are not like those kingdoms of the continent where tyrant kings stand on bayonets and the blood spilled by them. Cumberland was furious with that second verbal slap. Lord Melbourne, I will not let why! exclaimed the Duke in anger. Why me? Lord Melbourne continued, ignoring Cumberland. Certainly not because I am the best man, but I will tell you, gentlemen, that our Queen's marriage to a foreign prince will always bring trouble even serious trouble. Any marriage alliance with another kingdom or principality will drag us to the problems and conflicts of that other state. In these times of convulsion in Europe, that is dangerous. But we must also ask if we have not had enough of foreign interference in our domestic policy, especially of German dynasties, kings and princes, because being the most powerful country in the world I do not understand why we have to be subordinated to the interests of a small kingdom or German principality or of any other point on the continent, when he said that, Cumberland twisted his face angrily, but Victoria also opened her eyes with a little in surprise as she understood that it was also an attack on her maternal family, and we must ask ourselves if the British are not tired of so much foreign blood in our royal family, especially, if we suspect that behind foreign suitors not only come Trojan horses of foreign interests, but also probably Papist. Well said! exclaimed with satisfaction Wellington, and several of those present shared his enthusiasm. Marrying an English nobleman, Her Majesty sends the message that the royal family will be more English and less foreign. And Her Majesty trusts me, because she knows that I understand my place beside her, that of her loyal consort respecting that she is the only reigning monarch in Britain. And you gentlemen, I tell you I accept any condition that Parliament wants to impose on me, and to begin with, I do not want any assignment. I do not want a penny of assignment, my personal patrimony enough is enough for me. My only reward is to serve the country and the Queen, whom I love. Gentlemen, that's all I can tell you. A number of murmurs were heard among the attendees, mostly approving, with more or less enthusiasm. Wellington took the opportunity to speak and, using the words spoken by Lord Melbourne, convinced the majority of the council. Finally, the Privy Council advised the Queen to go ahead with her decision to marry Lord Melbourne, despite the objections of some members such as the spiteful and greedy Cumberland. This saved the first obstacle to the royal wedding. As soon as the council meeting was over, and the Queen was beginning to retreat, Lord Melbourne hurried out of the room through a side door, while Victoria eagerly sought him out. Lord Melbourne entered a small room where Lord George, who had not attended the meeting because he was not a member of the Privy Council, was waiting for him, for Lord Melbourne had asked the palace servants to accommodate his companion in that reserved place. Lord George was taking a swig of whiskey, and Lord Melbourne took the glass out of his hand and drank the whiskey with anxiety, and then took the bottle from the table and poured himself another drink, which he also drank almost desperately, while his hand trembled. Hey carefully that this is not water! exclaimed George nervously so bad things came out? George asked worriedly. The council counseled in favor of marriage, Lord Melbourne said earnestly, and then drank a third glass in one gulp. Seriously. But then, why? said Lord George, but then he turned to hear a noise at the door and then his eyes widened in surprise, Your Majesty. Hearing his friend, Lord Melbourne turned to meet the image of Victoria standing in the doorway, and when their eyes met both he and her expressed nervousness and anxiety. Victoria's eyes were red and damp, and in the gesture on her face it was evident that she was holding back the emotion so she would not cry again. Lord George felt uncomfortable. Ma'am, let me introduce Lord George MacPhail, Earl of Enniscorthy, my best friend since infancy, said Lord Melbourne, a little nervous, but trying to keep his composure. Your Majesty, George said, greeting her with almost reverential respect as he kissed the back of Victoria's hand. Lord George, it's my pleasure. Lord Melbourne's best friend is a friend to me, Victoria told him, trying to sound friendly and serene 
but her voice cracked a little. You honor me, your majesty, George replied kindly, and with a friendly smile. George, you would be so kind to leave her majesty and me alone, said Lord Melbourne a little more serene. Of course, with your permission, your majesty, said George. Yes, of course, Lord George, Victoria said giving her permission. George withdrew and closed the door behind him. An uneasy silence was made in the small room. Lord M. Victoria said hesitantly and very excitedly. Ma'am, please. Victoria. Said Lord Melbourne, trying to master his emotion. Victoria. Exclaimed Victoria, shocked and moved. Yes, you told me to call you by your name. Lord Melbourne said in a tone almost as affectionate as the one he used with her at Brockett Hall when she declared her love him, and he took Victoria's hand in his, caressing her. I want to apologize to you. No no need. It's me who? exclaimed Victoria, ashamed. No, Victoria. I must apologize to you, because I was very hard the last time we were alone. It's true, I'm hurt. I will not deny it. But I had no right to be cruel to you. My pain does not justify me hurting you, said Lord Melbourne, his head bowed so as not to see Victoria's eyes, for he was afraid to see her crying and betraying his own emotion, while he caressed her little hand. That I said out there, in face the council, everything was true, every one of my words, especially everything that concerns my, my love and devotion for you. It is no use denying it, he added raising his head to see Victoria to the eyes. Oh my dear Lord M! exclaimed Victoria, and began to weep disconsolately, pouting, very moved. My Victoria, so strong and so fragile at the same time, said Lord Melbourne stroking Victoria's cheeks with the back of his hand wiping her tears with his tender caresses. These days, I was reflecting, the man you just met, my friend George, reminded me of the kind of man I am. He reminded me of my mother, and what she admired in me, and for that, I understood that to her you only serves to cause me more pain and worse, to cause more pain to you. And today when I saw that they wanted to hurt you, I remembered the feeling, that feeling of need to protect you, even of me. Victoria, I can promise you nothing. I cannot promise you that my wounds will heal suddenly that my pain, my fears and my bitterness will disappear soon, if they disappear altogether, I cannot promise you that things will be easy between us in the coming days, weeks or months. I still do not know how we are going to face everything that is to come. But, if I promise you I will do my best to understand you and to support you in this difficult moment. I promise that I will be loyal to you, as always, and that I will protect you and child and that I will try to open my heart to you and dispel the darkness that is now in it, even if it is not easy, he added excited, his eyes sparkling with the dampness of tears that he held stubbornly. Thank you Lord M. I have no right to ask you any more. And I did not expect less of you, my dear Lord M., and you must be sure that I will do my best to reciprocate with all my love the love you give me, because today your words, today your words have to owe you. Victoria could not continue because she burst into tears like a newborn baby crying desperately. Lord Melbourne held her in his arms, and hugged her tightly, and she buried her face in his chest, stifling her strong cry against the man's strong chest. Lord Melbourne stroked the back of Victoria's head, over her hair, and with the other hand caressed her back. That was a few minutes until Victoria calmed down and then he slowly pulled her away and took out a handkerchief and wiped away the tears that were still left. Here, sweep your nose, Lord Melbourne said affectionately, putting his handkerchief in her hands. Victoria was a little surprised by the confidence with which he spoke, but then smiled and blew her nose trying to retain some dignity. Victoria, tomorrow I would like to have with you that conversation that I did not want to have the day you made me the proposal of marriage. You know what I'm talking about said Lord Melbourne, getting serious again. I understand, of course, Lord M. You are in your right to know everything, Victoria replied nervously, with the fear of disappointing him and causing pain, 
appearing on her face. Victoria, if you wish, you can call me William. It's fair, if I call to you Victoria, said Lord Melbourne serene and trying to be kind again. All right. William, Victoria said with a sweet smile. Victoria, can I ask my friend George to come in? Knowing him as I know him must be a little nervous, said Lord Melbourne. Of course. I'd like to know him better, she answered cheerfully. Lord Melbourne called him, and George entered with some improper timidity in him. But soon he came into confidence and Victoria seemed to find him very agreeable. Lord George. William, I would like Lord George and you to have dinner at the palace tonight, Victoria suggested, it hopefully. Well, I do not see why not, said Lord Melbourne. And you, George? I imagine you have no problem. Of course not. It will be an honor, Your Majesty, George replied gratefully. We'll be here tonight. But first we must do some errands, with your permission. Victoria, said Lord Melbourne gently. Of course, William, Victoria replied affectionately. Until tonight, Victoria, said Lord Melbourne and kissed Victoria on the cheek, surprising George and especially Victoria, who reacted with a gesture of happiness on her face. Lord George kissed the back of Victoria's hand, and with the permission of Victoria he and Lord Melbourne retired. They both passed between council members who had not yet retired, and some spoke briefly with Lord Melbourne to congratulate him. A Lord Member of Council approached a palace official on the sly and spoke discreetly to him. Then the council records took up all of Lord Melbourne's speech, the Lord asked. Of course, my Lord, said the official. Get me the copy soon and you will have a good reward. That speech is pure gold, replied the Lord. You will soon have it, my Lord. The Lord walked away smiling from the officer and hurried to Lord Melbourne to congratulate him warmly. At least that day, a certain happiness and enthusiasm was breathed in the palace, but there were still many difficult and dark days ahead. I invite you to join the Facebook group, For the Love of Vicburn. In that group many fans of Vicburn we gather in a pleasant atmosphere to enjoy our favorite fandom.